you know, we're trying to, at Invincible, redefine both the uh, idea of virtual sports and how people participate in virtual sports, and we're trying to redefine competitive gaming. You know, every quarter, we're releasing new aspects of our technology that, that make our horses more lifelike in terms of how they behave, both individually as well as as groups, how they um, compete in terms of the tactics and strategies that the owners are trying to employ in the horses throughout the race. We're actually trying to create learning systems and mechanisms by which the, the player's entity, whether it's a horse, a basketball player, a fighter, um, is developing. It sounds like one AI is teaching another AI something. That's that's like the holy call for us, is that when the, <laughs> we create uh, communities of AI athletes that are interacting and learning from each other, and surprising their owners with new skills. That's the, that's the holy grail for us. I think we're heading towards the matrix there. <laughs> uh, hi, John Rickham. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and Invincible. Sure. Uh, my pleasure to join. Um, my background real quick, I'm a Duke undergrad at uh, Wharton Business School. I spent years in doing m and work with G Capital and McKinsey and Company doing consulting work largely with technology companies and uh, energy companies around the world. And uh, about, geez, now two decades ago, I, I started my first company. Um, this is actually my third company, Invincible GG. Um, it was founded because I acquired uh, AI-based technology from a company in the UK, uh, Telewest, which was a large broadcasting company in the UK. And they had a really cool um, interactive television platform that did virtual horse racing on people's televisions from their remote controls. What I loved about it was not that piece. It was the piece of, uh, it was really early stage AI where, where it was learning horses where they had, um, horses were emerging throughout a race, uh, to com in competing real time against the other horses. It wasn't being directive by a player. Uh, it was self-discovery through the race. And we thought that was really neat technology that could be applied um, globally because of parimutuel sports and parimutuel betting. So um, if you guys follow horse betting, you know, there's fixed odds betting in the UK and Australia. The rest of the role for the most part bets on a parimutuel basis. And for parimutuel, you need to be, it needs to be handicappable, needs to be real time. And so we saw the AI platform as a way of grading um, real time races that were just like a real horse race that could be broadcast for wagering on a parimutuel basis. And uh, it seemed at the time like a no-brainer for us that uh, acquiring this UK-based company and taking that technology to the rest of the world seemed really simple. We didn't know a lot about uh, the regulatory environment and U.S. laws and international laws. And in the last uh, decade, we've learned a, a lot about it. But we've been doing it, uh, I think, the right way from day one. And we're trying to, at Invincible, redefine both the uh, idea of virtual sports on how people participate in virtual sports, and we're trying to redefine competitive gaming, helping people compete differently in the video gaming uh, world, uh, using their intellect and their brain instead of their tactile, their, their thumbs and their fingers. And um, in, in terms of uh, uh, you know technology, you mentioned you know the acquisition of an AI platform. Um, it, it, and AI, you know, it's the the hot the buzzword right now. Everyone's talking about it. Some people are excited. Some people are kind of, you know, looking at it, you know, with a, a little hesitation in terms of what I can do. Um, it, it sounds like you're taking UI and, and using it properly. Uh, <laughs> I hope so. In compliance, yeah. Um, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, uh, the the AI journey, um, the idea of uh, uh, you know, AI entities, AI powered entities is a journey we've been on for a long time and one we'll continue to be on, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, every quarter we're releasing new aspects of our technology that, that make our horses more lifelike in terms of how they behave both individually as well as as groups, how they, um, compete in terms of the tactics and strategies that the owners are trying to employ in the horses throughout the race. Um, the decision, the, the learning process horses make in the course of a race to say, okay, uh, I have this tactic, it's not working. How do I now improve my opportunity to win the race by changing my tactics? So we're not doing that. The player is not doing that. The horse is doing that. 
And um, so when you think about, when we think about AI, we're not talking about chat GPT or aggregating a lot of information and trying to uh, create something out of that information. We're actually trying to create learning systems and mechanisms by which the, the player's entity, whether it's a horse, a basketball player, a fighter, um, is developing. And that development happens both from a player instructing development. So when you train a horse, when you haven't learned skills, uh, when you breed horses and create um, offspring that, that have the genetic makeup of the parents, um, those are all things players are doing to um, drive the performance and the learning of this horse. But we also believe that we want these entities to learn on their own. And so if you think about this, um, taking it going from horse racing, taking to another genre that we're really excited about and developing technology for um, basketball. So if you think about rather than owning a horse, you now own a basketball team. And maybe it's a three-on-three basketball team. And these players um, come with different shooting skills, different moves, uh, different defensive strengths and weaknesses. You as a coach uh, want to implement a system. Um, and so there's, again, all this kind of directive things a player is doing to, to teach their team how to improve. But then you take that and say, well, what about this player goes off and trains another player? Maybe I've got the legendary Kobe Bryant on my team. He's going to go uh, practice with Larry Bird. And you know he's going to learn things from Larry Bird. And we're not instructing him what to learn. It's, it's, it's his own uh, uh, process and his own intellect and his own learning that's happening. He comes back to us with, you know, a uh, an incredible look away past from Larry Bird that he didn't have before, and uh, that's how we think about AI, which is how do you create um, athletic related entities that are not only being developed by their owner, they're also developing themselves in an emergent way. And we're not there yet. I mean, this is this is kind of what we're trying to achieve, um, but we're a long we're a long way away towards it. And we think we got pretty cool. Uh, horse racing and probably uh, truly unique in the role of virtual horse racing, um, the only AI power racing out there. We're only, we're only races that are not determined by mathematical equations or by RNGs. Ours are actually virtual horses competing in real time against each other. Pretty interesting. So it sounds like one AI is teaching another AI something. That's that's like the holy grail for us is that when the <laughs> we create uh, communities of AI athletes that are interacting and learning from each other and surprising their owners with new skills. That's the, that's the Holy grail for us. I think we're heading towards the matrix there. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that, 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 that's really, you know, in January, it's very, very cool. Um, and, and in terms of like the, the availability of your platform, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of more focused on like sports betting. Um, is, is this something that's available in the same states that sports betting is, how, how is that regulated? Yeah, so there's different uh, parts of our ecosystem. And so the part where, so we have players, uh, our, our mobile game is launching uh, in the days ahead. So we'll have our private beta uh, in October. We'll have our public beta in November, December, and our full release first quarter of next year. Um, the people that are competing in those events, those events are broadcast to casinos. And so we already have events being broadcast across Nevada. Uh, our product and technology has been uh, yeah. approved. It's been uh, ELI certified. It's um, available in a bunch of casinos in Nevada today. Um, we are uh, expanding our distribution to Latin America currently. We'll be uh, countrywide in Panama at all the tracks, casinos, betting shops in the, in the country, as well as on mobile by uh, first, second quarter of 2024. Uh, and we're likely to be countrywide in the UK in 2024 as well, as well as to several um, regions of Australia as well. So when I say available, that's the betting side, which is our races are being distributed to partners who are licensed. It's legal wagering. It's certified and approved by the the regulatory bodies in those countries or states. Um, and uh, uh, so we're expanding our distribution while we're now bringing players into the the uh, the game to actually own the horses that are running in these races. That makes sense. So you can go today uh, to Nevada at one of 15 casinos, 16 casinos, and wager on our races. They don't include real people today. They include only CPU horses, but when our uh, public private beta goes live, the horses will be real. Meaning, oh my, 
Is that a mobile? So when I'm in Vegas, am I actually interacting? Is it just a retail? It's something that sports, I'm not using, it's not mobile in Vegas or is it? Well, so it's yes and yes. So, I mean, if you walk to uh, a Boyd property, or you walk in the South by, which is my, one of my favorite, because it's got a phenomenal horse racing customer base. Okay. You go into the race book, there are 50 screens in the wall. Uh, we are up on a you know a quarter of those screens. And people can place bets uh, on those races. And uh, if you walk in, if you're at, if you're at uh, you know, we're integrated with all three major totes that basically have 80% of the global uh, uh, distribution for horse racing. So if you're in Panama at any of the racing betting shops or at the track, I mean, you see our races on the wall. Those are what we call in owner's club terms, those are public races. Um, the casinos call it winner's circle. It's our it's our licensed and approved uh, uh, virtual racing. In the game, owner's club, the mobile game, so if you want to participate in that race, you do it through your phone. If you want to train, care for your horse, feed it, um, compete peer-to-peer. So we have public races where people are participating as being broadcast at public locations, why we call it public racing. And we also have player versus player, uh, where the people are racing one on one against another player. They're racing their entire stable, up to seven horses against another player, seven horses. They're participating in contests, clubs, leagues. There's a lot of self formed uh, player versus player uh, racing as well, which is we're the only guys that do that. Everyone else does scheduled racing or public racing. Um, we do. So if the three of you want to be in a race, or in a race club together, we can form it ourselves and race against each other any time of day. We're real money. This is a skill game. If as long as we're in states that permit uh, real money skill gaming. So will you be real money and crypto? So you also you have a whole NFT, you know, side to this, right? So how do I, you know as far as your kind of economic ecosystem with your customer base? How's that? How's that going to look now? Yeah. So on the road, we are definitely. Um, trying to be accessible to everyone. So okay. if you want to come and play our game for no money, free to play, you can get a free horse, you can spend the time to develop that horse, train it, care for it, breed it, all those things, um, and participate in our races and our gaming, no problem. If you want to, if, you have, if you're short of attention span and you want to do that quickly, you can buy a you know partially developed uh, trained horse or a fully trained horse or buy a premium horse, with U.S. dollars or, or any fiat currency um, and participate in our mobile game and put those horses in races as well. Um, the kind of upper echelon of horses in our game out of the gates, we do sell as NFTs. And we do that because we're embracing um, uh, that idea of uh, decentralized real ownership and um, people having the assets in their personal wallets versus on our servers. And... Um, so you are a crypto player or you're a crypto enthusiast, you absolutely can buy NFTs with cryptocurrency. We accept Sol. We will have our own token. But we also allow people to buy NFTs with US dollars or fiat currency. And so we do that by having a custodial wallet so people don't have to have their own crypto wallet. They can hold the horses in our wallet on a temporary basis until they do have their wallet. So we're trying to reduce the friction. We want people to have the opportunity of real um, ownership and uh, in terms of actually they hold and own the asset. Uh, but if they're not comfortable with cryptocurrencies, we're happy to facilitate on an easy basis. We're trying to get people in our game as many ways as possible and as uh, simple as process, well, as simple as possible for them. So as, a, as an owner of a NFT horse, um, I can submit that horse to a race, right? And the, and the race could be broadcast at a casino in Las Vegas that people can bet on if that my horse wins how, how does it work from the owner side do they get some kind of payout or is it just uh uh a, a skill right that, that the horse has just learned so it depends so again it depends on uh we give people lots of choices they can choose to participate in races that where the currency is what we call gold coins which is our free in-game currency that people get hundreds of thousands of to start the game. They can, so they can participate in races with gold coins. This costs them nothing. They get gold coins back. So they have more coins to spend in the game. You can never check them out, so it's not real money. Um, we also have races that will be uh, U.S. dollar denominated. 
So you are actually putting real money in to participate in the race. Um, that's only those are only available in 37 states. Nevada is actually not one of them from mm-hmm. uh, at the start. Oh, wow. um, and so uh, in those races, the winners basically split the pot. So if there's a ten dollar entry fee, let's say, and there's 14 horses racing, racing the top five horses will split the 140 dollars. Um, we also do a crypto as well. So there'll be specific races that are crypto denominated and players that want to participate in those have to participate, um, with crypto. That will probably be our token only. Eventually we may, may do soul based races. Um, but we're currently thinking it will be our token only. So essentially it's, it's almost like a, um, in, we call it a gaming token where it's basically the utility of the game to play the game. All you can do with the token is play the game. And so it's a mechanism for, and we get discounts and we give the, our tokens away for free. And it's a way to get people um, playing with this, with a crypto based currency um, in our ecosystem. But there, but it is, unless it's a gold coin race, there is real value exchanging hands, which is why we only do it in 37 states. Interesting. Um, and besides horse racing, are you looking at any other sports? We are absolutely. We've already developed a. Um, we have a. We have a partner in in Las Vegas called Competition Interactive. Um, they have a really cool kart racing game, um, and uh, that will likely be our first foray into car racing. But it's more like Mario Kart. Um, and uh, we're also uh, looking at a car racing game, a basketball game, and a fighting game. Um, on those three. Our intent is not to build our own graphical engine. It's to partner with the best in the world in terms of AAA content. So, you know, we would pick our, you know, the creme de la creme of a basketball platform and integrate into our ecosystem. So it's a value add in terms of the things we're doing. Um, let's just, you know, the leading gaming companies like EA and 2K Sports are not doing the things we're doing with their platform. 2K has just recently begun doing some stuff in the metaverse, but it's not like what we do. And so there's a good collaboration there, possibilities. And in terms of fighting games, like the UFC is looking to do something like we're doing, and that would make sense as a partner for us, or working with an already existing uh, uh, fighting platform like a Mortal Kombat. Those type of platforms all fit very well in the world. So our intent's not to recreate the wheel to try to create new IP that competes with leading games. Our strategy is to partner with leading game companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense because it's. And if you check out my board, you'll see that we got some some heavy hitters in terms of the gaming industry. Um, uh, you know, the, one of the founders of Westwood Studios, the former head of strategy for EA, and was chief operating officer for EA for almost a decade. Um, we have the guy that created EA Big, and uh, probably the greatest title sports title ever um, to come out of there. NBA Street was his title. We've got uh, we got, and obviously we've got uh, on our advisory board lots of other people like them. That are really helpful to us in the video game industry. So, yeah, now yeah, that, that, that's interesting uh, because yeah, if you look at all the video games that we've probably played throughout our, our lifetimes for fun, now you know there could be a little bit something on the line. <laughs> you know, well, I think that's some sensory really experience. Things that we're if you look at our mission. I mean, we we uh, we don't throw it around a lot because it's big. They're big words. Like we like to think we have another whole set of. I didn't, didn't mention that uh, the ecosystem is patented. So what we do in with our AI and our simulation for the purposes of wagering is patented and protected. Um, we have another patent which was just approved last year that re- we think is the you know, esports version two. It's the competitive gaming of the future. And, and what we want to do is not, like I love esports, but it's 16 guys, largely guys, competing against each other on television or in a stadium and everyone else is watching. And we want people, even while you got tens to hundreds of millions of people to play games like uh, Call of Duty or play fighting games, who want to compete, they want to compete for real money. They don't. They they would prefer to be in the action than versus watching it in a stadium or watching it on television. Um, no one's really pushed through uh, Las Vegas or the you know the, the various regulatory bodies. How do you actually do that legally? And um, We've created a really cool technology that's looked at, looks at the uh, regulatory environment and says, because you have to have a unique balance of skill and chance to be permissible. And we've done that and uh, our patent was awarded. And and I'd I'd say the next couple of years, we'll be revealing 
that whole arm of this. But the whole goal is to get the mass market of people competing in video games, whether it's a fighting game, a basketball game, a horse race, or you know, a first person shooter. And letting people put real money in those events against each other legally and let people bet on the events legally as well. And uh, that's really what our company is about, is how do we make that vision of letting everyone compete for money legally viable. Um, so when you look at when you look at that and you look at scale, you know, you just talked about scale, you know, with you have such great technology, you know, how do you scale this to that consumer? Because that gaming consumer is so you know, you have this great board with all these guys from EA and stuff. When you sit around the table and you think about scale, what does that look like? Like, you know, you're in horses now. Are you looking that, at a territory by territory? Are you looking at state by state? You know, how's that process? Yes, it's, it's a, it's the, it was the one that I assumed was easiest in the way in, or would be easy. And it's by far the hardest. So it's a great question. The um, uh, it's the reason why we focus on horse racing. To be clear, okay, because horse racing, from a technology standpoint and a global standard standard standpoint, um, everyone shares the same betting system. The paramutual betting system, uh, you know, as I said, there's three major totes. They all communicate with each other via what's called ITSP. And so if I'm if I'm running a race in the real world at Hong Kong Jockey Club, that race can be wagered at at the track in Santa Anita or a betting shop in New York because the language with which they communicate, the race schedule, the participants, the finishing, the bets, the pooling of the bets is standard. Um, and if you look, I mean, Horse racing is still the second highest wagered on sport in the world. It's the third or fourth most viewed sport in the world. And so you think about global distribution and getting out to, you know, being in the backs of a hundred billion dollar business and with hundreds of millions of maybe even billions of followers globally, it's a nice way to get from where we are in the US, Bethesda, Maryland, out to the world without having to invest in 10 different technology platforms and integrating with 40 different sports book providers, everyone's on the same platform. And so that was step one. Um, we do believe that partnering with the horse racing industry and in, in other segments with the incumbents in those industries, so whether it's the NBA or the NCAA, whatever we're gonna do. Um, but the horse racing partners is critical, which is why we already work with the three major totes. We already have partnerships with big US companies. We are close to finalizing partnerships in the UK, Australia. We've had a long-term relationship with the Hong Kong Jockey Club. So we are, we are, and they have the customers, right? And so um, again, this is this is very different from other NFT gaming or or crypto gaming or even mobile gaming companies. We are trying to work through them to their customers and help them bring new customers into their sport, uh, new demographics, you know, levy their sport up, but also bring them into our game, educate them on horse racing, and get them to be better fans of horse racing in general. And so there is a cycle there that we're trying to drive. But Kaylee, it's a hard one because we really are, you know, we're um, we're in a role where uh, if we were just a mobile game, no big deal. Now that we're in, it, we're not, now we they know we're an AI company, we're in crypto. It's a little. It can be scary to traditional racing, but I think the issue with their um, aging customer base and their lack of, of interest from younger demographics um, makes what we're doing really important for them as well. Yeah, this got, this has got the Gen Z kind of appeal where they they're used to the guy just you know writing it writing in his book kind of thing. Yep. Every generation. Yep. The other thing we're doing, which I think is. Um, you look at our competitors in the crypto gaming space. Um, they went to market right away with, uh, you know, good products. They uh, did not try to partner with horse racing in terms of uh, respecting a regulations or respecting IP. Um, and it's taken us longer, but we've been very respectful of those things. We, everything we do, um, we're looking to partner. We're looking. So we, we would never use or allow a real horse's name to be used in our game unless the owner of that horse is getting compensated for the use of that name. They've agreed to license it to us for use. And so we are talking to all the syndicates. We're obviously dealing with the, the major horse owners. Um, we're looking at the uh, whatever entities control the historically great horse names and rights. 
uh, and trying to work through them versus trying just to take for ourselves and, you know, play the, it's crypto, it doesn't matter game. Um, we're very sensitive to that. We worked very hard to, uh, to make sure the things we're doing are in partnership versus in competition with the industry. Well, I mean, this has been educational for me. I mean, this is a, you know, really, you know, fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for, um, you know, your time today. My pleasure. Yeah. Great. Nice to talk with you guys. Yeah, excellent. Now I got to get, you know, get myself, uh, get, get myself into horse betting here and yeah, uh, get, get, get I'm creating a horse. I have to start working on my horse and my management skills. I'm all, I'm all in. <laughs> all right. All right. We'll get, we'll get you in our first batch of, uh, of Barbada. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.